it will work. Yep, that's it. And just use the arrow keys. Arrow keys down. And, yep. Yep. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. So our um, next uh, presentation before morning tea is by uh, Eric, and he's going to be talking about his experiences with the Buford assessment model and um, what he's learned over 20 years. All right, thank you everybody. Um, believe it or not, this is my first CAPA meeting, <laughs> which I had to think about, but yeah. I know, yeah. Um, and and I'm, I'm giving a presentation that has no equations and no lines of code, so I don't know what that says. Um, anyways, I think this is a good presentation to actually follow up uh, Andre. Uh, he was sort of presenting things from the development side. I'm gonna present things from the operation side, so the experience we've had in Beaufort over 20 years in basically trying to crank out assessments and what we've had to do software wise, what we've had to do internally development wise for ourselves um, to make this work. So I was gonna, here's a quick general outline, give a little background for those who don't know Beaufort, don't know the Southeast Science Center very much. Um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about that and then go into some of the, um, Details of BAM, which is the assessment modeling system, which I prefer to call it a system rather than just a single model um, that we use. Um, for those who don't know, the Southeast Fisheries Science Center, um, we cover a lot of territory. Um, we are responsible for a lot of fishery management councils, as well as ICAT and highly migratory species. Um, in total, the center probably deals with 400 plus stocks um, and we have a large geographic footprint um, as shown here. Um, the lab is, um, our lab is actually lo located in North Carolina and then we have satellite labs. Our main center is in Miami, Florida. Sort of here's sort of our footprint of species cover that sort of area. But what I'm gonna focus on is the South Atlantic, which is our, the Beaufort Lab has more or less been tasked just to deal with the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council and the species that they're in within their jurisdiction. And that basically includes um, sort of about 80 species of snappers, groupers, jacks, porgies, um, typical reef fish, tropical sort of reef fish. Um, our fisheries are roughly about 30% commercial and about 70% recreational, which those who deal with recreational data know that's a challenge because recreational data is very uncertain in, in many cases. Um, sort of some of the data, just a thumbnail sketch of the data we deal with. So we, we have some good age sampling and length sampling, but generally some species it's very poor, but we're, we're looking at sample sizes roughly from zero, maybe 400 at the most uh, for some of our species. So I would say moderately low sample sizes in terms of what we're dealing with data wise. Um, the fishery independent data is only covers a section of the shelf. So there's only certain species that it's good for and others that it's not so good for. And then some species, we just don't even intercept them at all in our fishery independent data. So in, in a sense, we have to rely on, rely on fishery dependent data in some cases for CPUE data. Spatial data, very limited. Well, we don't have good programs for tracking uh, locations of catch, locations of fishing effort, um, it's just, been a resistance from the fleets and and of course being recreationally dominated you don't get that detailed information from that, that as well so sort of the models we've worked with over time included include surplus production models um, age structured production models and sort of your classic age structured uh, integrated analysis type model which is our predominant model um, we've more or less abandoned the production models thanks to some reviewers that said, don't do that anymore, just use age structure production models. So we're going down that road. Um, here's a, a, just sort of a thumbnail sketch of, you know, sort of the history. Uh, what, where, how did BAM really get started? Um, it started essentially with my arrival in Beaufort. I started, I came out of Terry Quinn's shop um, back in the late 90s, um, started on the West Coast doing rockfish assessments. Well, while I was up in Alaska, Dave Fournier came up there and with his case of wine and his bag of tricks and said, here's ADMB, you guys should be using this. If you don't, you're stupid. And I'm, I don't want to be stupid, so all right, I'll use ADMB. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 
So I was like, okay, I guess I need to use this. Um, so after I left the West Coast, I went to the East Coast and nobody had even heard of ADMB at that point. And they're like, what is that? And I'm like, well, if you don't use it, you're stupid. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was like, all right, all right, we don't want to be stupid either, right? Let's do that. Um, so that's sort of where we started. And so I had a simple model coded up. And at that point, there was a point in time when I said, well, should I do this or should I just use stock synthesis? Because SS2 was out at the time. And I just, maybe that was a fatal decision at that point. I said, no, I'll just go with this new ADMB process and I'll let synthesis go by. And that's, that was the path I, I put on, uh, we, that put forward for the next 20 years, essentially. Um, so with, with the development of BAM and the use of BAM, there was a lot of skepticism in the Southeast. So the Southeast tends to be a very conservative, uh, change resistant area. So I come in with this bag of tricks and they're very skeptical and they wanna, then they create this whole assessment process, the CDAR process, because they wanna look at everything we're doing, what decisions we're making, they even wanted to examine the code. And so we had, we created this cumbersome bureaucratic assessment process called CDAR that unfortunately now takes us sometimes 12 months to complete an assessment because of all the stages in that process. Um, it's painful, but I guess it gets buy-in from the industry. Um, and so basically, and then my staff started to grow. Um, and so now I, I oversee about seven assessment scientists and we're, we're trying to just basically crank out assessments as much as we can. We're trying to get to the point where we can do two a year per person, not quite there yet, but we're getting close. But here's how BAM started. This may look familiar to some people who first started with ADMB back in the late 90s, early 2000s, is you basically created some ADMB code, a template file, and you fed in your data. You probably stored it in Excel and then passed it to the data file and then grabbed some sort of report file and then did something with it in either Excel um, and to create some graphs and then you did a Word report. Very cumbersome. So the first thing we did, because out of necessity, we were like, well, this, this damn plotting part is taking us way too much time. Let's try to automate that. So Mike Prager and I worked on ADMB2R, which was just a set of small code that basically converted ADMB output to an R get file using the dget function. That was nice. Um, and then once we did that, we could create a whole bunch of graphic suites to just sort of automatically plot all of that stuff. And so that came out as FishGraph. So that was our first big sort of leap into the BAM system. So now we have ADMB code. Now we have some nice uh, ADMB to R code and we have FishGraph. So we're on our, on our way. Well, then the natural next extension was, okay, well, what, now that we've got things in R, we can actually start to automate tables and, and create LaTeX code and generate our report. We're like, hey, this is great. So our, our goal all along was like, we want to get to that push button assessment, which Andre said we shouldn't be doing, but that's what we were after. It's like, we wanted to get to that one button push and, and your data runs and you have your model and you're ready to go and here's your report. Um, and at times we got pressure to sort of create a package or generalize this model, but we resisted because um, at this time, in the sort of mid 2000s, there were a lot of changes going on in, in the field. So we were wanting to keep up with that. And, and in particular, we had um, some reviewers, Patrick Cordu perhaps is one name that comes up, <laughs> who constantly criticized our models for not doing cer certain things and keeping up with the state of the art. And so we, we consciously decided, well, let's keep the code ungeneralized and we will just keep adding functions and we'll, we'll follow the, the state of the science. And so we never really turned this into a package, which is why people, I can, I guarantee I can ask how many people in here have used BAM. No hands will go up because it's been just an internal software package that we have used and we, it just works for us. Um, and the latest thing we're sort of looking at now is actually um, using R to sort of gather the data and do initial analysis on sort of just the data before it even goes into the model, pass it to ADMB, and then that's our whole system that we're looking at right now. So I guess sort of the lesson from all of this is to, to step back and realize that what we did in terms of development was largely driven by sort of the pressures we faced. And these are sort of the pressures that our, we had to face, which is 
everything from you know demand for more assessments was constantly on us um keeping up with the latest advances you know following the the golden age of of stock assessments as terry used to call it when there were a lot of advancements going into uh, developing over the model specifications and we got tougher reviews and there was public pressure and and all of these things sort of led to the uh, the effects here which is sort of you can see a lot of the arrows point to a standardized approach and and that's a again i go back to my comment about the southeast as being very conservative and change resistant and that's an important factor we've had to deal with in the southeast they didn't want to see a new model and in fact i would say now if a new package came out the the, the ring to rule them all we would have a tough time selling that in the southeast we'd have to do a sort of a gradual you know, side by side comparison and sell them on it before we could actually use it. And here's an example of how bad it got. This is sort of the high point of my career was when I got this letter. Um, this is actually from Marco Rubio's office uh, from the Senate, um, basically requesting that the Beaufort assessment model be inspected by the in inspector general. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was special. Um, <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> so yes, I have this hanging on my wall in my office because yeah, I'm proud of this moment. <laughs> yeah, so that I mean, that's an example of the atmosphere that we've had to work in uh, in doing assessments in the southeast. Yes, and they gave a very I mean, Rick actually helped with some of the response on that. It was a very generic response like, oh, we have this extensive process that we use for doing this and it's heavily reviewed and there's lots of transparency and nothing to worry about here <laughs> was basically the answer. <laughs> so um, I guess there's some things that we've learned, you know, from from BAM, you know, obviously um, there's pros and cons to what we chose to do. Um, it's a flexible, customizable system. We like that. Um, the problem is it's got a steep learning curve. And so every time I've had to bring new staff in, we literally have to go through, you know, almost like a three month training period for them or six month training period so that they can learn the whole system. That's a little bit costly, but, but again, the benefit is they, they understand the internal guts really well. Like Andre said, that's an important feature for a lot of, for a lot of us is you really need to know what you're doing. Of course, one of the other cons is error probability goes up. So we actually, you know, every assessment person is literally modifying the raw ADMB code and there's a chance for errors to creep in. So we, we very much work as a group. So we're always evaluating each other's models. And so, and, and we've, we've got, I think, a pretty good extensive suite of diagnostic plots that help us basically uncover any issues that might be going on. And yeah, so I mean, this is sort of uh, the pros and cons of this sort of approach. I asked my staff, you know, some of them have been working with BAM for a long time, you know, what would you say about it? Um, and these are the comments you get, which is exactly that dichotomy of, oh, well, it's great, it's flexible, it's one, it's that great, but oh, uh, it needs to be more generalized. Um, finding errors is a pain in the butt, all that sort of stuff. So I, 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 I think when we think about the next generation stock assessment model, some things we do need to consider is this sort of continuum or does it even need to be a continuum? Can we, can we create a package that is both flexible, open source, keeping up with the forefront of science, but also user friendly and doesn't require a year's worth of training time to learn and use. So that's, that's the trade off and maybe that, you know, maybe, Maybe Andre's right that every assessment person should be at that level of being able to do the coding and understand the inner workings well enough. But the concern there is that that's, a, that's sort of a high price to pay because essentially we're almost talking about having a graduate level person at the head of every assessment, almost a PhD level person at the head of every assessment. That's an expensive endeavor. Um, so that's something to think about when we move to the next generation assessment modeling. And I think uh, Matt Supernaw touched on some of this in his presentation, but some of the other things to always think about is this sort of usability, flexibility, performance, reliability, portability. Um, 
certainly the BAM system is not something I can just hand over to somebody and say, oh, I'd like to use BAM. It's like, well, it's a whole bunch of snippets of code here and there. Um, and of course, maintenance is going to be a big one. And that's one of the other reasons we probably didn't go into generalizing the BAM packages. We realized that that just comes with maintenance too. If other people using it outside of our group have questions, we don't have time to answer that. So we didn't want to go down that road. And so I think that's it. Um, I'll take any questions. So that's 20 years of experience of having to crank out assessments. <laughs> Well, thanks a lot, Eric. We have a lot of time for questions. Um, Rick? Which, which question? <laughs> Just a comment first. Uh, that letter from Mark Rubio? Yeah. That's what spawned the effort to do the model comparison that's project. That's right. Yep. Because we realized at that time is that even though I could write in the response that all of our models will produce the same results, we did not have anything that really demonstrated that. Correct. And so, you know, having a explicit uh, effort to uh, publish that we indeed could get essentially the same result from all of our main models, our yeah. standardized models, our assessment models, that was important to have. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Andre. Yeah. yeah, this is sort of a philosophical one, but you know, you guys have got a generalized platform that you make individual, which is an interesting exactly. combination. Right. Um, and as I look around the United States generally, and this is my question to you, is what other variables lead to consistency or not consistency? So the West Coast, and I think I know why, but I'm probably wrong, tend to all use stock synthesis. We are the home of synthesis. Alaska is totally variable. You've got Jim, uh, who is unique, um, and then you've got some stock synthesis assessments and you've got some AMAP assessments. Uh, Northeast has its own peculiarities. And I was, are there covariates that you have seen in, in your experience that explains the desire or non to, to, to go to sort of consistent frameworks because ultimately you know we're trying to serve all those audiences yeah yeah that's again speaking sort of from the the pressures that we we saw from managers and from reviews um there is this tendency to compare um assessment packages by the managers even even though they don't really fully understand what's going on they'll the you know the criticism is well you're using bam what what have, what would happen if you use stock synthesis what would happen if you use something else so there's that that pressure um but i also think that how these things evolved in the different regions honestly is um i think there was a lot of autonomy early on in terms of the assessment scientists choice to do what they wanted to and Maybe that's evaporating a little, I don't know, but yeah, I mean, and that's why I think you see, I mean, I, I actually was a, a I, I followed Jim a lot. I mean, he can probably remember when I was fresh out of uh, grad school from Terry's training, I was emailing him a lot. And, yeah. <laughs> Great, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, so I, yeah, it, it, I think there's a lot to be said early on that there was a lot of autonomy there for assessment scientists to choose how they wanted to do their assessments. I, I don't know, it'd be interesting. I mean, I don't know what Rick's think thoughts are on whether that, that pressure is changing, that there is more of a push to standardize things across the country or not. I, I don't have a feel for that yet. Well, I suspect there's fewer people who are feeling as though they have the time to put into yeah. developing their own custom. Um, on the other side of it, what you said about the cost of maintenance. I mean, uh, uh, if I hadn't made the personal sacrifice, really, to say that I will maintain stock synthesis for the community, yeah. uh, even though it really wasn't my job, to do so. It, it was something that I, it, it grew and, and now it's grown so big. And I think it's something we need to think about 
when we build packages that we expect to be generalized packages is that the maintenance is significant yep. and there, the, the help desk aspect of it is significant and we need to build that in and I think that bears upon how many such things should we do and uh, you know how much can we have uh, a very few number so that we actually can maintain the ones we choose and we choose wisely as to which ones to build. Yep. Yeah, the, just to, some experience from what I, we had at the Tuna Commission. So when I started there, um, they were deciding to move from VPA to um, a statistical integrated approach. And so we were thinking about using multi-fan CL because it was being used on the, the western part of the Pacific. But it was a black box and we, we couldn't get the code at that time. So my bosses basically said, we don't want that. Code it yourself. And so we coded... Uh, a scaler, which was a sort of a simplified version of multi fan CL. And at one stage, we were moving over to sex structure. And um, at that stage, we had to decide whether we'd go from you know, our own code or, or move to stock synthesis. Yep. And um, the main reason I moved over was because it was going to be a lot of work to code it, but also because I was starting to get people asking me to use the model, and then I had to spend time. Right. showing them how to use it. And so I thought, well, if I move to stock synthesis, I don't have to code it. It has all the features and I won't have to maintain it. So um, that's yeah. part of the reason. Yeah. Any yeah. other questions? Yeah, Andre. Yeah, I guess my, I mean, I still think we need to know the answer to this question was putting a lot of effort into deciding something that, you know, you've got to, you will build it and they need to come. Uh, but I think the other thing that I've experienced, and I don't really do a lot of assessments, is the review process. Mm -hmm. Anyone with half a brain can review a stock synthesis assessment if they reviewed 10 previous stock synthesis assessments. Right. Um, and the other thing that I, I, I say, I think that is really important. Uh, going back to the West Coast, there was always a worry that those individual models that we didn't see uh, but were reviewed had bugs in them. Uh, at least with synthesis, you know that most of the major parts are pretty damn, you know, if there's a bug, we're in real trouble. Um, so I think the review side is something that I would emphasize. Um, the other thing is expectations of reviewers generally. So if I'm in a review, I say, would you please do the following because it's easy. You probably can't do it because you have to recode your BAM model, whereas I at least know what synthesis can do. So I think as we have this discussion, what the expectations of the different user groups are, I think is is actually quite important. Yep. Agreed. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I, I have a question. So back in the old days when I was doing my own modeling, um, and the model was pretty simple, I would code it in Excel, and then I would code it in 80 model book. And they were completely different programming styles, mm -hmm. so you were unlikely to make the same mistake twice. Right. So now with these big models like BAM, stock synthesis, and all that, how do you make sure that you don't have a bug in your code? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. We, we have essentially coded up an operating model that matches it in R. And that was one way we tested it. And, and yeah, we've done lots of simulation testing along those lines. And, and of course, the nice thing that spun out of that is sort of pseudo MSE or, or you know, sampling strategy evaluations is what we've done with it is look at, you know, because we always get the question of how many ages should we be collecting? And, you know, that's a tough question to answer. Um, so we do simulation modeling to help answer that somewhat. But yeah, that's, we've even done parts, you know, we've, we've modularized the ADMB code. We have a lot of functions in there. And so we test the functions before we sort of make them live. Um, and yeah, and some of those we actually test in Excel as well. So it's Excel still a good, good tool every now and then for checking things. Yep. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Okay, if there's no more questions, um, we'll take the tea break and uh, back here at 11 o'clock.